Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, we're going to get started. This is session 1C planning, um, and I'm going to introduce our, our first two presenters. Um, so our first presenter, Santu Winter, is a project manager with Jacobs in Seattle, Washington. He has 14 years of experience helping municipalities understand their wet weather problems and developing creative solutions to address these challenges. And our second presenter is Beryl Fredrickson, and she's a senior engineer in the Integrated Capital Management Department with the City of Spokane. She has 15 years of experience with water, stormwater, and sewer capital planning, design, and construction. She manages asset assessments and pilot studies, and she uses modeling and GIS software tools to analyze intricate issues and create best fit solutions for the City of Spokane. So please join me in welcoming Santu and Beryl. Good afternoon. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, today I'm here to present. Oh, here we go. Okay, starting again. Okay, um, I am here to present with Santu Help, uh, the City of Spokane's system-wide stormwater and wastewater risk assessment. Again, my name is Beryl Fredrickson. And I work for the city. This is Santu Winner. He works. So um, the overall agenda, we're going to talk about project content, why we decided to look at risk and resilience. And we're Santu's going to discuss the risk framework and the assessment results from the analysis. And then I'm going to get to talk about the fun stuff, where we talk about the next steps in the implementation. That's Santu. <laughs> Okay, so um, so the project context. So um, the overall um, part of the Growth Management Act for Washington State requires the city to update their capital facilities plans every seven years. And this is the first time that the city is taking a deeper dive into this analysis uh, in a project called Link Spokane Utility. And we're um, in the middle of really honing in the strategies for water planning decisions. But we're about to use that same framework for wastewater and stormwater capital. So part of this, as we were going through the analysis, we realized that um, we could kind of look at waste water, or sorry, water separately, but we couldn't separate wastewater and stormwater. We needed to look at them holistically. So this is a broad overview of capital facility planning. And so you have your key basic components where you identify your problems, you prioritize those problems, you develop solutions, and then you organize those solutions. Okay, so the risk assessment itself takes a first look at compiling problems and prioritizing them and identifying the next steps and possible solutions. So one thing is that EPA actually required the city of Spokane to um, do a risk and resiliency assessment for water. And um, we were absolutely floored that the same requirement wasn't required for wastewater and stormwater. So we said, you know what, it would be a a best management practice of our own to actually implement this project for wastewater and stormwater. Okay, so the outcomes. So the outcomes of this project are we've got to find out really truly what are our issues with the city of Spokane, what are our problems that we need to focus on, what are we going to do to mitigate risks, and this whole framework can be reused over and over um, and modified as time goes on. So if we find out that this framework, this matrix that we're developing um, isn't working or we could make it better, we can modify it as we go. But we're building the framework now. So with that, I'll let Santu jump on and take the lead. The green Thanks button's forward. forward, okay. Hello everybody, uh, pleasure to be here with you all today. 
I don't think I've ever given a talk in a room this size, so this is a new experience. Greetings also to folks who are joining us uh, live streaming through the interwebs. Pleasure that you guys can join us as well. So B provided some context for why, how did this project come about? It's kind of this broader context of this capital facilities planning process that's going on for water, sewer, and stormwater. And that's one of the reasons why this risk assessment project is looking at wastewater and stormwater together as opposed to separately, because it's part of that broader context. We'll talk a little bit um, about the approach and how all this kind of, uh, how all this all played out. And I would guess that many of you have worked on various risk assessment projects before and are familiar with the basic concepts of risk. Um, I'll try to highlight some of the key takeaways that were very educational for me in going through this process. And perhaps those are some nuggets that you guys can take away from this presentation. So there, there were five steps to this, to this project. I think there were five. We'll find out as we go through these slides. The first one was to categorize the Spokane facilities into different categories. We didn't want to just get everybody in a room and talk about risks for the entire stormwater and wastewater system. We wanted to provide some level of organization to it. So we decided to split it up into these six categories, sewer collection, pump stations, CSO facilities, the Riverside Park Water Reclamation Facility, or the treatment plant, SCADA, and stormwater. You notice SCADA kind of cuts across a number of different facilities. Um, part of the decision to do that was that the folks within the city who operate and maintain the SCADA system um, op operate and maintain the SCADA system regardless of what facility it's in. So that was the first step, was to provide a little bit of organization. Bear with me, I'm gonna just make sure I know what time it is. Okay. Second step was to identify risks and it seems fairly straightforward and self-explanatory. Uh, we had six workshops, one for each type of facility. We included staff from all the different areas within the city, be they planners, engineering, operations and maintenance and management. And I think one of the key takeaways for me was that it's important to have those people together, not physically in a room because this was during COVID, but remotely together um, and having a facilitated process to help draw out some of those risks. Sometimes just kind of, you know, sending the spreadsheet to folks and say, populate your risks and send them back. It, having a facilitated process creates a little bit of space for people to get their creative juices going and really start to think about what's worrying them or playing off of each other's ideas and thoughts that somebody shares a risk and somebody else adds something else to it or maybe something that's related to it. That was a very fruitful discussion to just have those folks together in a room. I worked with City of Spokane for a, a number of years um, as part of my career, but I'm not an expert in the city system. The folks who are operating and maintaining and planning and engineering and designing and managing, those are the folks who are the experts that having those folks together was really valuable. So we had, we carved out 10 minutes in these workshops for people to think about risks and then we had people write them down and then we did a round robin to share those risks. Um, and then at the end, we kind of stepped back and made sure that we were capturing the full risk profile. So we had a pretty robust um, set of risks. There was about 20 for each of these six different categories. So not overwhelming, but um, a sufficiently robust collection of risks. So the th third step was to evaluate the risks. And you guys are likely familiar with risk, the score being calculated as the combination of the likelihood of the event occurring along with the consequences of that risk event. But what a consequence being like, what are the negative things that could happen? Um, you might notice that oftentimes the risk score is the product of the two, that if you have a risk score, excuse me, a likelihood score of three and a, and a consequence score of three, then the product being nine is a risk score. You'll notice that either we are very bad at multiplying or something is going on because one of the key takeaways for us was we decided to use a skewed um, risk profile, risk score profile that puts a little bit more weight on uh, the consequence side of things. You'll notice um, a risk that has a consequence score of five and a likelihood of one has a score of 18, whereas the inverse, a consequence with the risk, a risk with the consequence of one and a likelihood of five has a score of six. So that's just, recognizing that this risk assessment is focused on identifying the kind of the top risks. We wanted to put a little bit more emphasis on the consequence side of things. And it was interesting to see how this kind of played out, that it does kind of change the overall risk um, portfolio. What, what are the things that are bubbling to the top? All right, step four was um, talk. So now we have our list of risks. We have scored them for their consequence of likelihood. And we did some creative math to get the, the risk score. And the next step is to um, talk about, okay, what are we going to do about these risks? It's one thing to just identify them, but 
it's a really critical step to think about, okay, what then are we gonna do about it? Um, so that was also a collaborative discussion um, with the city. This, with this approach, we had the consultant team took a first cut at based on our understanding of what all the city's doing and kind of engineering best practices. Um, these are kind of recommended treatments for these all these different risks. And then those were reviewed collaboratively with the city. Um, so a little bit less collaborative than the risk identification, but still have that collaborative piece, which is really important. Um, a lot of different examples, condition assessment, capital projects, um, new studies, plans, budget allocations. I think one thing that was a surprise for me and should be noted as a key takeaway here, um, but I, I didn't have a chance to put it in here. I was kind of expecting that the risk assessment would have primarily capital projects of like, these are the projects that we should build to address these risks. But a lot of them are kind of like policies or plans or initiatives or like organizational things um, that are really important that maybe a traditional capital facilities planning process doesn't capture. Um, so taking this risk-based approach, which is very much centered on people sharing their thoughts and concerns leads to different types of solutions and treatments that are needed as opposed to a traditional capital facilities planning process. The capital facilities planning is also very important, but this is kind of a different perspective. And then we categorize these by existing things that the city is already doing and new things that the sh city should consider doing. Um, and it was important to capture, not necessarily credit, but kind of capturing what the city is already doing. And it actually ended up being a really viable exercise as we'll see here shortly. All right, <clears throat> fifth step is to prioritize the risks and the risk treatments. And that key takeaway note there is focused on prioritizing the risk treatments. It, in the past, when I've worked on these sorts of risk assessments, they're usually focused on like a capital project or something like that. We usually focus most on prioritizing the risks and then coming up with what we're going to do about it. But in this assessment, it was really informative to prioritize the risk treatments um, because that helps prioritize what are the things that some of the risk treatments cut across multiple risks. And so it was helpful to see which ones float to the top, which are the most important things to do. One thing to know, what are the most important risks, but even more important is what are you gonna do about them? So one of the key takeaways, um, dare I say best practice, is in identifying the risks, it's important to identify not just the event, but also why is that important? So with this one, this particular one here, if I can, if I can read it is, H2S caused by low flow at a pump station force main cause. So, so that's kind of maybe the shorthand version of the risk, but then we ask the question why, or kind of what are the consequences rather? Well, that causes the deterioration of downstream pipes and manholes. Okay, why is that a problem? And then that results in odor complaints, hazardous work environments, costly repairs, and so on. So it's important to take it a couple steps further other than just identifying, we have H2S problems in our force mains, but then a little bit more about why is that a problem? That was really helpful and helped tee off the risk consequence component um, because that gets you thinking about what a, What's the problem with this risk event occurring? The other key takeaway is to assign a risk owner. Um, we could go through this whole process and come up with these risk treatments and prioritize risks, but if they're not actually assigned to either an individual or to a group, it could be that they just kind of float out there in a spreadsheet and nothing ends up happening. So thankfully, you know, this one of the things I love about working with the city is that they're all clearly enjoy working together. And so it was kind of a collaborative process of figuring out like who is the owner of these risks and kind of where do these land. Okay. So now let's look at some of the results of how things shook out. We'll start kind of big picture and then we'll zoom in a little bit closer on some of the specific risks. So this chart shows we're presenting results based on the category of facility that we're looking at. Um, the, the, Blue bar is the average risk score for that facility category. The whiskers at the top and bottom represent the lowest and highest risks for that category. And then the orange ball is the number of risks. Um, it was interesting to see that there's a fairly consistent number of risks for each of the different uh, systems. The exception, the treatment plan had, had a slightly more risks that were identified for it, but fairly consistent in terms of number of risks. Um, and it was interesting to see how the overall risk profile emerged for these different facility types, which you can see here. So here we just took the, the consequence, no, excuse me, 
the risk score for all the risks that were identified for each facility category. And we added them together to kind of come up with a composite risk profile for each of these systems. Treatment plant came up with the highest overall risk profile. We'll dive into that a little bit more here shortly. Not far behind as the sewer collection, stormwater, and pump stations. Um, there were a couple of risks that cut across all of them, and it was kind of difficult to know, like, where do these land? How do we kind of handle these? So we put them into their own category there. But here's another way we kind of looked at the data. Um, we tried to approach it from kind of a different perspective. Um, I find this one really interesting where we took the average, we took all the risks from each of the facility categories and we took the average and then we put them into the scatter plot. Um, there's a couple conclusions that emerged from this that were um, interesting and insightful on how to, how to move forward. The first is that the treatment plant tends to have high consequence risks that are unlikely. Um, one of the top ones that emerge is like a digester um, overflow event due to foam. I think that's what it was. Um, confined space. That's a high consequence risk that has a low likelihood of occurring because there's a lot of things that are ongoing to, to mitigate that risk. And I mean, if you think about it, like a treatment plant is a dangerous place to work, right? So there's lots of high consequence risks that are less likely to happen. On the other end of the spectrum is a stormwater system, which tended to have low consequence risks that are more common. Um, for, let's see if I can remember some of the examples. Um, Precipitation kind of has a big impact on things. Um, flooding events, of course, those have big impacts, um, but they don't tend to have quite as big consequences as like, you know, something going wrong at the treatment plant. Um, so it was interesting to see that their overall risk profile is a little bit different depending on the different type of facility that you're looking at. Oh yeah, another one with the stormwater is like um, aquifer pollution or emerging MS4 requirements or TMDOs on the Spokane River. Those are important and risks that need to be managed, but they you know, don't necessarily pose that risk to human life and, and health in the same way. The third interesting observation was that there's a lower risk likelihood for the treatment plant and the combined sewer overflow facilities and IPTs, also known as interceptor protection tanks, which basically help, help um, buffer against peaks in the interceptor system by providing some, in, some storage. Um, and it was interesting to see that these two floated kind of to the, I guess, to the left side there with lower likelihood. And I think a big part of that is because the city's invested a lot of resources into those systems. Um, the city's recently finished construction of uh, the next level of treatment at their wastewater treatment plant, um, tertiary treatment. Is this feeding back? Um, And also finished constructing CSO storage facilities, um, which represent hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of investment that have really done a great job of reducing the risk profile. To a degree, you, can't, you can do things to reduce likelihood and risk consequence. Um, there's only so much you can do to risk the consequence. Um, so you can see that those risks were kind of pushed to be less likely, but the consequence didn't necessarily go down. All right. So we'll, okay, so those are kind of some bigger picture results. And now let's drill in a little bit more into what some of the example risks are that were floating to the top. Um, we already kind of talked about this one a little bit. This is the H2S caused by low flows, deteriorating the system, resulting in odor complaints and hazardous work environments. We gave that a four because of the hazardous work environments, um, likelihood of five because it's something that happens. Um, it's a known problem that happens on a regular basis. Overall risk score with a creative math was 23. Um, the existing treatments, these are preventative things like mobile gas detection equipment, ongoing implementation of H2S, uh, or projects to address those. And there's a big project ongoing that B will touch a little bit on the condition assess the lift station condition condition assessment project. Um, that's one of the big themes that are that's emerging from there. But some new things came up too. Of it's one thing to prepare this plan, this pump station condition assessment plan, but let's not forget to implement the recommendations that are in there. Sometimes plans have a tendency to just sit on shelves. So that was one of the risks. Um, I'm going to maybe move on to one that's touching on the treatment plant. Um, this was kind of interesting. And, and this is just stuff that like the operators and the people who are, are working there would really think of. The plant's access by, uh, plant access limited by a single narrow recreational road along an erodible bank, Audrey L. White Parkway. Um, there's a little room for expansion, and there's a risk of not being able to access and respond to emergencies during a road blocking event. Um, 
so high consequence uh, because you know if something goes wrong and there's emergency services aren't able to get to the plant, that's a that's a serious problem. Likelihood is fairly low, um, it, and it's sometimes with you know thinking through these likelihood questions, you have to kind of part it's part science, part art, right? Of kind of figuring out how do you balance things because well there is only a single narrow recreational road along an erodible bank to get to the plant, but you don't have to get a fire truck down there every day. So we gave it a score of three for the likelihood, overall score of 22, and identified some things that the city was already planning on doing. This is a risk that was already on their radar um, that they knew they had to address. And I think that's where the identifying existing treatments and new treatments was useful because it helped justify a lot of the things that the city was doing. It kind of put them into context. I think that was one of the other key takeaways was that it really validated and confirmed the city's priorities in terms of the kind of preventative actions that they're putting in place and the planning projects that they already have ongoing. This really helped to validate that, yes, those are important things to do and you should continue doing them. Um, let's see. Here's, here was an interesting one. Uh, changes in future precipitation patterns resulting in lack of capacity in the sewer system causing surcharges and backups. Um, Related to another risk with CSOs exceeding that state threshold of one event per year uh, per outfall. We gave it a high consequence because not only can it be very expensive, but it can have an impact on all different parts of the city system. Kind of medium likelihood, that's not to say that climate change isn't happening, but the, the impacts of climate change kind of materializing in the near future, you know, is, is was that storm caused by climate change or would it have happened anyways? That's a little bit more difficult to say. So the overall score we gave was a 19. Existing treatments, ongoing system-wide sewer model calibration really validates that yes, that is an important thing. It cuts across a number of different risks um, and a new risk treatment of developing these, considering the development of modified precipitation time series that reflect the potential impacts of climate change. That was something that we thought could be a useful way to um, kind of help mitigate with, uh, up for this risk. All right, so then stepping back and looking at the Overall risks, we've kind of touched on a number of these. You can see there's a few that float to the top um, that are in that, in that red category. There's a handful in that orange category. Um, I think it was interesting that there's a pretty good spread in terms of the facility categories that were leading to kind of the top risks. Um, that was really helpful. Um, to, it was very helpful to see the sign there that you held up, but it's also very helpful to see how all these risks kind of came together. And what I think is in, interesting is that because we had the skewed um, risk scale, all the, all the risks that kind of float to the top have consequences of four, of four and five, essentially. And whereas the risk likelihood kind of ranges from, from a two to a five, that that just kind of shows that we're putting a little bit more emphasis um, on, the, on that consequence side. Okay, so the next step, thinking through risk treatments, there were 67 new risk treatments identified. Many were repeated across different tasks. Um, and what we ended up doing was we added up the risk score that corresponded to the risk that that treatment was applied to. And when we added those together, we could come up with like the, what is the risk score that that treatment is addressing? And that was kind of how we, that was how we ended up prioritizing the, the new treatments. So here's kind of the top ones that flow to the top. Um, continued phase implementation of the city's collection system SCADA master plan. That SCADA was something that came up again and again and again and again, nine times in fact, I counted them. Um, cutting across a number of different risks, many of which rank very high, that I think this helps justify that the collection systems gate a master plan implementation of that makes sense on many different levels. It's something that the city should continue doing. Another one that emerged a number of times, um, eight, eight times across the risk assessment was continued or implementation of the recommendations from the pump station condition assessment project, but that's a very valuable project that's been ongoing for uh, I think a couple of years now. Um, and implementing those recommendations that come from that will, will go far in reducing risk profile. Number of other things emerged several times here. Um, the second to the bottom there, develop knowledge transfer and retention program. That was kind of interesting that it, it came up in just about every different facility category that we're looking at that city recognizes that people are retiring. And you know, of course, people, people are always retiring, but making sure that that knowledge is being captured somehow and how do you kind of pass it on to the next generation of engineers and planners and, and maintenance staff who are, who are picking up the reins. 
So with this information, we were able to then kind of provide not just the prioritization of the risks, but also the prioritization of these are the things that you, the city, should consider doing. And this is kind of how the score is laid out in terms of the um, risk reduction that those were providing. So with that, B will talk a little bit about um, next steps and implementation after this project. Okay, this is the best part to me because this is actual progress. Uh, no, no, thank you, Sanju, for all your work. <laughs> no, I like seeing action in the field. And um, so this is a piece of it. And I love this assessment because what it showed is that the city of Spokane is on the right track. Like Santu said, a lot of the projects were already implemented. A lot of the tribal knowledge we knew needed to be recorded. And so um, here's a list of projects that were already started implementing. We already started this data master plan control. We're gonna start with CSO 24 and 26. It's the largest flows, the largest storages to control those. And then we'll expand out from there to our next largest facilities or our facilities, CSO facilities that are near fiber optic line or comm lines and then also additionally connect our lift station and sewage lift stations, and then eventually, hopefully storm. But we have a dry well rehabilitation project in wellhead protection zones. We have annual funding in line in our six-year capital plan. And once we've completed that, um, that area of rehabilitation, then it will only expand from there out to our city limits. Um, and then we realized that we had a couple of priority projects um, that we wanted to pull forward. So we didn't, we knew it was a risk, but we didn't realize the ratio of risk. And one of those is the TJ Meenock bypass, which I wanted to bring something physical. Here's draft drawings. We're actually implementing it in the field. It's gonna be constructed in uh, 24. And its purpose is to relieve flow from our really old and very large uh, interceptors. We're gonna leave it, uh, relieve that flow right before a siphon. And um, in most extreme um, occurrences or events, and so that we try to ensure that the chances of ever blowing out the treatment plant from a huge extreme event will be very unlikely. It's a end all be all solution. Um, we're also upgrading our digesters and our outfall reply outfall pipe and repair and placement program. Um, our outfalls are some of our oldest and original infrastructure. So it's time that we start um, replacing and updating them. And one of the continuing, continuing projects that I'm a part of right now too is the lift station assessment. Here is the Clark station, our largest lift station. And in the lift station assessment, we're looking at electrical, structural, mechanical capacity, um, pump vibration, uh, uh, MCCs, new codes, and making a to-do list of everything that we should address, whether it's the city staff that can address it, are they small items, are they large capital items that need to be addressed, and we're coming up with a priority list for each of those, thank you, um, each of those lift stations, and then from there, we still have work to do where we're going to write uh, an executive summary where we prioritize each lift station. Does it make sense to do these upgrades or does it make sense to do a complete replacement or possibly a, a lift station elimination? Um, that's also been an option as well. It's been a fun project. And then, um, so we are, okay, I've got to read this one straight from the slide because this is a tongue twister. We have developed a multi-objective decision analysis matrix for the water capital facilities plan. And we are going to be using that as a backbone to um, also create one for our wastewater and our stormwater capital facility plan. And I'll show a little bit more in detail on this in a minute. It's kind of um, needs a little bit more explanation in the next slide. So we've also added for over a year now, um, monitoring in our stormwater outflow. 18 of our largest MS4 basins, we've added stormwater monitoring. And we have GIS data, we're pulling that GIS data into SWIM models, and we're gonna use that monitoring data to calibrate our stormwater models and um, hopefully find the right fit, best fit solution so that we can provide any bit of treatment before our stormwater goes directly to our river. Um, and then we're also in the process of creating future flows for our sewer um, 
system. We have recently calibrated our CSO basins. We're in the process of putting it all together in one system-wide model, and we're gonna apply our future flows to it and see if there is any new pinch points, any new um, future risks that we didn't know about before as city of Spokane grows and as our service area grows. And then all of this information will ultimately be collected and it will feed our capital facility wastewater and stormwater plan. So I said that I was gonna talk a little bit more about MODA for short. Um, this is an example of one component of the, one category, I guess, of the MODA uh, matrix. And uh, there are three overarching subjects. There's sustainability, there's social responsibility, and then affordability. And under the sustainability, there's subcategories like regulatory, water stewardship, resiliency, staff planning um, tools. And then there is social responsibility. It's another category, health, safety, level of service, reputational risk. We don't want to be on the national news. We really just don't think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, affordability, cost sharing. Is there any way that we can be smarter about these exorbitant costs that are coming after COVID? Um, equity, equity is a big piece of this. There's huge, um, there's mul multiple subcategories for equity and long-term costs. What truly is our cheapest uh, but most effective um, solutions for the city because we don't wanna spend um, an inevitable, we, we don't have the budget available to spend our, our dream of our future uh, without a balance of reasonability, I guess. And so you can see on the MODA um, table that there is different criteria which are applied for the water. And there's the best management practice all the way to the most minimum expectation. And the city of Spokane would always love to be on the best management practice side, and we do strive to do so. Um, but we are ranking ourselves through all of those different sub columns that based on the criteria. And then there's also an importance factor. How important is this? It's kind of like the risk and resiliency assessment where we are ranking some subcategories a little bit higher than others. And again, this level of detail will help feed our wastewater and stormwater capital facility plan. So with that, I guess my time is up and I should probably end it on that note, but it's exciting to be working on all these fabulous projects and it was fun too, so thank you. Are there any questions? That was great. Um, thank you, V. Thank you, Santu. Um, so now we have five minutes for questions. Um, there's a mic in the middle of the room if folks want to walk up to that one. And I can also walk this one around. Oops. So I see we have two, two questions. I'll let you all use this mic in the center. So um, I just wanted to ask you a question regarding your risk uh, risk score. I know the scale was zero to 350 uh, when we we're looking at the other slides, but then how you, I wasn't sure exactly how you ascertained those numbers. Is that based on multiple matrices or I was kind of confused with that number. That's my question. Talking about kind of the risk matrix. Yeah, so when we started going over them and you had like the 23, 19 and you have all of those, but then we had a scale of zero to three fifty. I thought earlier you're talking about risk score and on the other okay. axes. Ah, oh, yeah. So that's why I was like, I see different numbers. Yeah. I'm not really sure which ones. So oh, it's, sure. you're basing it off of just these matrices. The the highest score that an individual risk can have is the highest score that an individual risk can have is twenty five. Okay. But it, it it could be that probably gets a little confusing when I start to then we added. The risk scores for all the risks together right and that's where, okay. we, where we got to okay okay that's where you're three good yeah yeah exactly um i was wondering that you know um if we look at the recent events in dallas um city of dallas or even in mississippi you know like say they are getting the whole year's worth of rainfall in a six hour period and did you guys consider that that if 
who can has the you know the entire year's rainfall or the CSO system like what happens in six six hours you get all the rainfall or something like that. I'm wondering that if the cities needs to consider those type of parameters, considering the extreme weather that we are having. Sorry, but can you repeat the line? Um, the city of Spokane, I don't know if we're, we always think about those 500 year storms, the thousand year storms, and but according to some of the climate research, our peak storms are, we're supposed to expect a 10% precipitation increase for some of the climate change that we're expecting. So um, with that, we're taking some of our largest storms. We had a almost over in a 500 year storm that came through the city of Spokane, where it actually blew out some of our monitoring equipment um, because the flows were so great. So um, that is actually uh, what we realized is inspiring our TJ Minoc bypass. So we have a relief in those extreme cases where we're going to redirect those huge storms. Um, but yeah, that did play a piece of it. And we, we definitely consider it. So there's different safety factors that we can apply based on um, the climate change models. But, and it, we're always adding a climate change aspect to our future contracts as well. Um, yeah, that's a really good question of, of how did we handle kind of extreme events. And I think it highlights that this risk assessment was very focused on talking to the people who own and operate and maintain the system. It wasn't based on running hydraulic models and seeing how big facilities should be and where the water goes. That I think this risk assessment works best when it's paired with the capital facilities process that does look at what happens when the 500 year event comes through because that that isn't a risk that came up was like you know 500 year event like you know why <laughs> washes out the treatment plant or something that is something that needs to be considered but it wasn't necessarily a, we didn't have the analytical tools to be able to answer those thoroughly in this particular assessment All right i think we have time for one more quick question Just on the kind of opposite side to that, a lot of these risk assessments go and look at the capital planning for long-term future facility changes. And one of the things you highlighted there is one of the more frequent risks or the biggest risks um, was H2S from your pump stations and force mains. What consideration was given to the operational budget and short-term changes that can address problems like that that won't fall under the capital facility plan? Okay, that, um, that's a perfect Point of why we're doing the lift station assessment. And part of that assessment actually comes helping me with that up project with parametrics right now. Um, so uh, that and actually um, Jeff over there at Humphreys is helping with future flows as well. So um, part of the lift station assessment, we're looking, we're going to be looking at that at the executive report. Um, where we've identified these H2S concerns. We actually have a pilot study that we're working on right now, which is love. We're looking at ozone for treatment of H2S um, uh, to not use bioxide. Um, it's costly. It uses um, resources and space and uh, ozone is little filament lights that, um, you know, like hunting equipment um, is used to eliminate odor. So those are some of the things that we're doing where we're, we're creating a to-do list, basically. And then in order to realize, should we go ahead and replace, totally um, replace the, the lift station, or should we add treatment? Um, and we'll do almost like a, a separate risk assessment and a pri project prioritization of whether we just want to replace that lift station or not, or make all the mitigations that are absolutely required. Okay, my time's up. And if you have more questions, you can talk to me and we can talk more specifically.